began in the pre-dawn darkness of March 6, 1836. Mexican General Santa Ana ordered an assault force of 1,800 men to unleash its fury on a tiny band of Texans, defending a fort called the Alamo. Most of us have heard of the battle. Heroes like Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie going down in a blaze of glory. Americans against Mexicans, good versus evil, freedom versus tyranny. But the real history behind the battle is far different. On one hand, it tells how Texas became part of the United States. On the other, it reveals how Texas was torn away from Mexico. To some people, the Alamo is an emblem of American aggression against Mexico. To other people, the Alamo is an emblem of heroic self-sacrifice for a larger cause. They claim that they're fighting against tyranny, they're fighting against injustice, they're fighting against oppression. In general, Mexicans see the events that took place in Texas as the first part of an American expansion. And it may have been a victory for Santana, but I think it was an even greater victory for the humanity of those defenders. In the United States, the Alamo has become obscured by myth, which complicates what really happened here. For example, at the time Jim Bowie died at the Alamo, he was a Mexican citizen, not an American. And many of the Alamo defenders were born and bred Mexican natives, not Americans who came down from the north. So what has evolved into a race war was really something quite different. People tend to view the Battle of the Alamo as a clash of cultures, and it's not that. It's a battle that's part of a larger civil war. So the issues at the Alamo are not issues of race, but they're issues of competing political systems. The Texas Revolution was rewritten as a war between white and brown, between good and evil, between a civilized race and an uncivilized race. When I was in third grade, we took a field trip to the Alamo. As we exit out the back of the Alamo, my best friend nudged me and said, you killed them, you and the other Mexicans. And that story stayed with me for a long time. And it's not that I didn't realize I was Mexican, you know, I never doubted that. I just didn't realize it was a liability in the eyes of my best friend. The Alamo story even has its own vocabulary. A Texian is an Anglo-American who immigrated to Texas. A Tejano is a native Mexican Texan. The ranks of the Alamo defenders included both. There are other more common words in the Alamo dictionary as well. Freedom, honor, and sacrifice are trumpeted loudly in telling the Alamo story, especially in the American view. But listen to the Mexican storytellers, and you will also hear slavery, speculation, or treason. The differences arise in part because so many accounts emphasize just the battle of the Alamo itself. But that milestone is only part of a much larger story. This cross-cultural symbol was originally a mission called San Antonio de Valero. Built beginning in 1724 outside the town of San Antonio de Bejar as an outpost to help Christianize Indians when Mexico was still a colony of Spain. The mission itself was a series of buildings within a walled compound. The missionaries planned to build a beautiful church as a symbol of their allegiance to God. Construction was started but never completed. The roof of the unfinished church remained open to the sky when Spain closed the mission in 1794 because local Indians were, by then, well integrated into the community. A few townspeople took up residence in some of the buildings and the compound acquired a new name when a unit of Spanish soldiers began using the site as well. The troop came from the Mexican town of Alamo de Paras and from them the mission became known as the Alamo. It was 1803, and the forces leading to the landmark battle were beginning to build. 
think it's important when you're looking at the Alamo to be able to put it into some sort of continuum because otherwise it's an event that really doesn't make much sense. Why is there a battle? Why does San Antonio have this Texan fort? Why does Santa Ana come there? And so you really have to look at the events leading up to it to get the significance of why the battles fought. Important to the events leading up to the Alamo were the controversial actions of filibusters. Today, the word means a prolonged Senate debate, but the Alamo definition is far different. A filibuster is a private armed individual who engages in a military activity, a military expedition against the domain of a country then at peace with the United States. In the ever-increasing hunger for new land, the territories of Florida and Texas were targets for American filibusters, who fought for independence in both places beginning in the year 1800, when they were still parts of the Spanish Empire. In the real history of these epic events, filibusters and the Alamo go hand in hand. The truth of the Alamo and the truth of the Texas Revolution is that it's a filibustering expedition. Here you have Americans who, against the official policy of their government, they are crossing over the border and they are fighting for Texas independence. To Mexican history, the filibusters were rabble-rousers. To American history, they were freedom fighters. There is some truth to each side of the story, but the roots of the conflict were much more complex and would all come together at the Alamo. The bloodletting that would erupt at the Alamo on March 6, 1836, was the result of more than a half century of conflicts over land, borders, slavery, and politics between Americans and the neighboring territories of Spain. It's virtually impossible to separate so-called pocketbook issues, land sales, land values, slaves, economic issues, from patriotic and political issues as well, because they're always inextricably intertwined. The man who's fighting for his country is also fighting for himself. So in a way, patriotism is a kind of enlightened selfishness. And that is certainly the case with the Alamo. Since its early years, the United States had the urge to expand its borders, tending to covet the lands of its neighbors, especially the Spanish territories of Florida and Texas. Americans look at the Spanish territories not necessarily as permanent features on the political map, and either legitimately or illegitimately that they will become part of the United States. It wasn't only a hunger for land. American presidents from Washington to Monroe feared invasion from the European powers lurking just over U.S. borders. There is a British neighbor to the north, and there is a Spanish neighbor to the south and to the west. Those European powers did not look favorably on the American Republic with its Republican ideas. There's always the concern that these European monarchical powers will be conspiring behind the American back to end the American experiment. So for all of these presidents, the best thing to do is remove these European powers, to remove the source of trouble, to remove the source of friction. In 1803, President Thomas Jefferson negotiated the Louisiana Purchase with France. The new land gave the United States a common border with Spanish Texas. But the boundaries of the Louisiana Territory were only vaguely defined. So disputes over ownership of Texas began quickly. With the rapidly growing USA just next door, Spain felt the pressure. Texas always served as a remote outpost of the Spanish Empire. Spain never had enough men in Texas to effectively garrison the region, nor to effectively control the region. And Texas was a rich prize. The land was immense, with broad pastures, lush rivers, and a warm climate ideal for the agricultural society of the time. Americans crossed the border illegally to settle the empty territory. In 1813, American filibusters joined with Spanish colonists opposing the rule of Spain in Texas. They had secretly negotiated with Secretary of State James Monroe. 
the rebels, Monroe believed, would deliver their new territory to the United States. Monroe is willing to make deals on the side. Money, supplies are being funneled into East Texas. The U.S. government is going to be actively involved in a private context. Yet, when it becomes public, the U.S. government is going to deny its involvement. Monroe, however, did not expect the Texas rebels to declare their own independence. They called themselves the Green Flag Republic, and aid from Washington evaporated. It becomes pretty apparent to Monroe that this is not going to become a part of the American constellation, that it's going to be a free and independent republic. That being the case, perhaps we need not to provide as much support to them as we had promised. Without U.S. support, the rebels could not prevail, and the Spanish quickly crushed the Green Flag Republic. The Republican forces are defeated, but they're not just defeated, they are annihilated. There are about 400 prisoners that are rounded up and are executed. The policy was one of no quarter, the enemy annihilated, no prisoners taken. Among the Spanish officers who suppressed the rebellion was a young lieutenant, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. Historians tend to think that for a young, impressionable Santa Ana, this becomes the basis for him of the idea of no quarter that you see carried out in the Texas Revolution. Even with the demise of the Green Flag Republic, there were other rebellions in Texas. So the Spanish turned to diplomacy with the U.S. to see if they could save the rich territory by giving up something else, their claim to Florida. In 1819, Spanish Foreign Minister Luis de Onís and United States Secretary of State John Quincy Adams hammered out a treaty. The Spanish thought they would be placating the United States by saying, here's Florida, in return, the Spanish thought that they would be getting a secure title to Texas. Adams obtained Florida for the United States. Spain also dropped its claims to a section of territory on the Pacific coast. Now the United States was a transcontinental nation, stretching from sea to shining sea. On the day the treaty was signed, Adams wrote in his diary, this is perhaps the most important day of my life. Onis believed the deal he negotiated was good as well. On paper, it was. And it all had to do with Texas. For Spain, the signing of the Adams Onis Treaty in 1819 put to rest the claim that the United States had any right to Texas whether as part of the Louisiana Purchase or, or any other prior claims. While the treaty locked the western border of the southern United States at the Sabine and Red Rivers, expansionist politicians demanded territory as far as the Rio Grande, claiming Texas was part of the Louisiana Purchase. However, there would be no further discussion with Spain on the matter. In February of 1821, after 11 years of fighting, Mexico obtained its independence from the rule of Madrid. The lands of independent Mexico included the rich expanse of Texas, which would develop a growing penchant for autonomy. Mexico's hold on Texas would be tested by a flood of American settlers and a potent mix of ambition and ideals that would explode at the Alamo. The story of the Alamo is, in part, a tale of early Americans on the move, pressing beyond the borders of their country and settling in Texas when it was still foreign territory. In 1821, Texas was a province in the nation of Mexico, with the ever-expanding United States right across the border. The Mexicans addressed the situation with a new immigration policy designed to transform dangerous filibustering Americans into loyal, productive Mexican citizens. It was called the impresario system, and cheap, fertile land was the bait. An impresario is a land agent. He's the middleman 
between the American immigrant and the Mexican government. The sort of person he wants to attract is the hard-working, industrious, God-fearing family man, yeoman farmer, who, who is going to give his industry to Mexico. The impresarios offered settlers a league of Texas land, more than 4,000 acres, for $30 on credit, no money down. The same spread in the U.S. would have cost 5,000 cash, more than most Americans would see in a lifetime. Mexico offered the average Anglo-American immigrant more opportunity than the land of opportunity itself. In return, Anglo immigrants readily agreed to become citizens of Mexico and adopt Catholicism as their faith. Impresarios also stood to gain. Once the agreed upon number of colonists had settled, the impresarios were rewarded with sizable land grants of their own, 22,000 acres for each 100 families they brought in. Stephen F. Austin was the first and most successful of the impresarios bringing some 300 families across the border. This primitive map of his colony was said to be hand-drawn by Austin himself in 1822, at the start of his efforts. He is known today as the father of Texas. He doesn't come and try to impose his way on the Mexican government, but he tries to learn how do you operate in this system? How do you make it work to your advantage? And what he was able to do was to forge friendships, genuine friendships with Mexican politicians in a non-threatening manner. In the fertile countryside, the new settlers prospered. Rich harvests of crops and livestock turned once wild territory into thriving communities, where impresarios exercised benevolent leadership over their colonies, in harmony with the government of Mexico. But one of the impresarios, Hayden Edwards, turned to filibustering to break away from Mexico. He declared independence, naming his colony the Republic of Fredonia. Hayden Edwards fully expects his fellow Americans to, to join him, but successful impresarios like Austin and successful colonists are not going to sit by and watch this bozo filibuster threaten the lives that they've made for themselves, the very successful lives. And they are keeping faith with the Mexican government that has kept faith with them. The Fredonian Republic was quickly crushed with help from the citizens of the Austin colony. The crisis had been diffused. But other Anglos in Texas would cause trouble on their own when the issue of slavery became important to the region. The Anglo-Americans who came to Texas in the 1820s and 1830s uh, were primarily uh, natives of the American South, of states that, uh, that had slavery. So Texas was essentially a southern state and therefore a state that supported slavery uh, from its beginning. Mexico itself abolished slavery in 1829. Slave owners in Texas were allowed to keep their slaves, but there was no assurance that would continue. The federal government in Mexico didn't like slavery, was critical of slavery, periodically threatened slavery, threatened to do something to extinguish slavery in Texas. It was this issue that made Mexican authorities first take notice of William Barrett Travis from America's Deep South. He came to Texas with a slave named Joe and was a militant supporter of slavery as an institution. Travis had arrived in Texas like many others, on the run from his past and searching for his future. William Barrett Travis left Claiborne, Alabama in 1831 as a man in disgrace. He was only 22 years old, yet he was already head over heels in debt. He simply rode out of town in the night, abandoning wife, child, business, abandoning everything. And when he appeared in Texas and applied for his own grant and his own citizenship, he actually listed himself as a bachelor, pretending as if he did not have a wife back there. 
Trained as an attorney, William Travis went to the town of Anawak on Galveston Bay, a place where there were few lawyers. He opened a law practice and prospered. He also found plenty of time for romance. He lives the life of a bachelor with uh, glee and sometimes exquisite detail. He describes his romantic escapades in a diary that he kept in 1833 and 1834. Senor, we must a year after coming to Texas, Travis took action against Mexico's anti-slavery policy. He confronted Mexican authorities when they tried to give shelter to two runaway slaves from Louisiana. Mexico has abolished slavery. But these old Southerners like Travis and others think this is an affront to the rights of slavery. It doesn't matter that those rights don't exist in Texas. They only exist in the United States. Travis and his supporters openly challenged Mexican officials. And the confrontation threatened to erupt in violence. Travis and others are actually arrested by the com commandant at Anahuac and incarcerated. Well, the arrest of Travis leads all to a virtual uprising of all of his friends, and they threaten to attack Anahuac, and suddenly a situation has come about in which the Mexican commander actually threatens to kill Travis if he's attacked. Ultimately, the crisis was resolved without casualties. However, Travis spent nearly two months in jail. He emerged as a leader of the War Party, a militant faction in Texas, openly advocating armed conflict to break away from Mexico, and he raised troops to carry out the fight. Travis led another assault on Anahuac in June of 1835. But even at that late date, less than a year before the Alamo battle, most Anglo colonists still would not join Travis in open revolt. He feels the anger of his fellow Texans who are basically saying, Travis, will you sit down and shut up and stop causing trouble with Mexico? Travis alone had little effect on Mexican policy, but Mexico had combined Texas and neighboring Coahuila into one state. Impresario Stephen Austin objected and was imprisoned for 18 months, an incident that spurred Texans toward rebellion. Jim Bowie was another American who advocated war for Texas independence. He was 39 years old at the time of the Alamo. Bowie was a Kentucky adventurer who, like many Alamo defenders, came to Texas to escape from his past. But even in the sometimes rough company of the Texians, Bowie's background was extraordinary. There's no question that James Bowie was a large-scale criminal. Everything he was doing was against the law. Bowie's scheme was an outgrowth of the Louisiana Purchase. The United States had announced it would honor land grants issued by Spain while Louisiana had been a Spanish possession. Bowie forged literally hundreds of Spanish land grants, awarding himself vast stretches of prime riverfront land. James Bowie was involved in land grant fraud on almost an industrial scale. Had he succeeded, he'd have been the largest private landowner in America and probably the first millionaire west of the Mississippi. However, misspellings, repeat signatures, and other errors alerted officials that Bowie's documents were suspect. Investigations were opened, claims rejected. Court cases against Bowie under the fraudulent names he used filled newspaper pages. As the news tightened, Jim Bowie began to look at Texas as a place of refuge and opportunity. All of his land fraud schemes in Louisiana and Arkansas exposed, Bowie himself facing probably someday an eventual indictment for fraud. Texas was simply a new board on which to play his old game. Yet he wound up getting caught up in it and becoming a Texian patriot. Bowie was far more than a white collar criminal. He was famous for the wide bladed knife that bore his name. And by all accounts, he was a natural leader, a loyal friend, and a man of astonishing bravery. He and a small group of friends once faced a large Indian war party in the Texas wilderness. Bowie and company poured accurate fire from a sheltered position for 13 hours, claiming they killed 30 or 40 before the Indians finally gave up the fight. It became part of the Bowie legend across Texas and elsewhere. It was well known in Texas because it was a local event, 
And it got rather well known in the East thanks to the fact that Bowie's brother Reason wrote an article about it that appeared in Philadelphia's Saturday Evening Post. Bowie embraced his new home in Texas and accepted Mexican citizenship. At a well-appointed home in San Antonio known as the Veramendi Palace, he married the daughter of the state's vice governor. In the end, Bowie's personal qualities seem to have outweighed his reckless criminality. You find many accounts of people who don't like what James Bowie did in his own time, but you rarely find an account of someone who didn't like the man himself. But the man most Americans identify with the Alamo is probably David Crockett, more commonly known as Davy. He was a charismatic Tennessee hunter whose ability to spin a yarn made him a national celebrity and helped him get elected to Congress beginning in 1827. David Crockett really is America's first media celebrity. The newspapers were publishing stories of these these fantastic adventures by David Crockett riding a streak of lightning, taming alligators, and all the rest. The first distinctive American character is the Westerner, the frontiersman, the man in buckskins who talks in a funny dialect and lives outdoors by his wits and conquers nature. And Crockett came to epitomize all of these characters. Legend says that Crockett could kill a bear simply by grinning at it. He had a rifle named Betsy. And his backwoods charm was so irresistible, there was talk of him running for president in 1836. That is, until he failed to get re-elected to Congress in 1835. Defeated congressional candidates are not likely to be presidential candidates the following year. And so in 1835, after his defeat, he tells his constituents, you can go to hell and I'll go to Texas. With talk of a revolution in Texas, Crockett, at age 49, saw opportunity and headed west in search of a fresh start. Tennessee had played out for Crockett, and so Texas is the next frontier. He's easily the best known man in all of Texas when he arrives, and it becomes clearly and quickly evident to him that there might be a new political future for him out there. And if Crockett performed well in this revolution in Texas, what might be the outcome? Where might he go? Maybe he could be president of a new republic west of the Mississippi, since he could no longer have a chance of being president of one to the east. The press kept a devoted nation informed about Crockett. On January 29, 1836, this article appeared in a New York paper. At a time when tensions in Mexican Texas were reaching a boiling point, it included a speech in which Crockett proclaimed that he would have Santa Ana's head. Less than a month later, former Congressman Davy Crockett, along with Jim Bowie, William Travis, and some 250 others, would face Santa Ana and his troops at the Alamo. In 1824, three years after Mexico won its independence from Spain, the new nation enacted its constitution, modeled in part on that of the United States. It set up a nation in which former Spanish provinces became states, Los Estados Unidos Mexicanos, the Mexican United States. Guadalupe Victoria was the first president and the first to confront the Texas problem. The influx of Americans under the impresario system should have stabilized the territory, but instead it made the Mexicans apprehensive. There's always a concern in Mexico City that if you scratched the skin of a peaceful American colonist, what you might have just beneath the surface is a hostile filibuster. So, you know, they do have considerable justification for concern. American designs on Texas came from Washington as well. President John Quincy Adams quietly offered Mexico a million dollars for the troublesome state. Victoria turned down the money and assigned General Manuel de Mier y Terán to go to Texas and examine the state's potential for Mexico's future. There was something else as well. The authorities in Mexico City uh, said, look, while you're up there, uh, keep your ear to the ground because we are a tad suspicious of the intentions of some of these Anglo colonists. The reports Mier y Turan sent back were not encouraging. 
Foreign farmers settle where it suits them and take over whatever land they desire without approval. They all go about with their constitution in their pocket, demanding their rights. The predominance of North Americans will be the cause for the Mexican Federation to lose Texas unless measures are taken. The bottom line, in Mier y Terran's view, Mexico had created a monster. What you have is illegal aliens, and the concern for Mexican authorities is you just have no idea how many of these people we're talking about. But we know it's in the thousands. Pressure continued from the north. When Andrew Jackson became president, he authorized another attempt to buy Texas. This time, the price was $5 million. The mere offer was a public relations disaster. The idea that President Jackson wanted to purchase Texas was very disturbing because what it tended to do was to tell people in Mexico that the United States wanted parts of their country. Mexico was determined to hold on to all of its country and passed a tough new measure to do so. Based largely on Mier de Terran's reports, it was known simply as the law of April 6, 1830. It's an anti-immigration law. It's an attempt to stem this demographic tidal wave that is sweeping into Texas. The irony, of course, is that even after the law of April 6, 1830, Americans continued to come into Texas, in this case, as illegal aliens. Mieri Terran hoped the new law would allow Mexico to benefit from the rich lands of Texas by stopping the flow of Americans so Mexicans could develop the state for themselves. But he was frustrated. After President Victoria served out his term, a chaotic succession of leaders followed as internal political disputes sapped Mexico's ability to hold on to Texas. On July 3, 1832, the despondent Manuel de Mier y Terran took his own life. He left behind a sad letter asking, in que parará Texas? What will become of Texas? Perhaps the answer was more than this loyal Mexican could bear. That same year, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna entered the Alamo story when he unleashed a rebellion against then Mexican President Anastasio Bustamante. The bloody clash was fueled by competing political ideas the federalism of Santa Ana and the centralism of Bustamante. Centralism, on one hand, wants the power of government centralized in Mexico City, a strong central government. The federalists, on the other hand, are suspicious of a centralized government and believe that the power of government ought to be disseminated uh, among the states. One of the Texian leaders who announced support for Santa Ana was none other than William Travis. It no doubt seems odd, but at the time, Santa Ana proclaimed himself a Federalist, one in favor of the dissemination of power, the dilution of power to the local states, which is exactly what those early in Texan leaders wanted. Santa Ana was a skilled general and a hero of Mexico's fight for independence from Spain. He himself became Mexican president in 1833, advocating federalism. But then he changed. He suspended the Constitution of 1824, now seeing federalist autonomy as a threat to the stability of Mexico and his own grip on power. Santana very quickly shifts from being a federalist to a centralist to a dictator. And so those like Travis, who had once stood behind Santana, are now, of course, going to be right in front of his guns. Santa Ana's guns would also be aimed at Tejanos, Texans of Mexican birth. Their stake in the story made them passionate supporters of federalism. They were horrified that the Constitution would be voided by the president in Mexico City. These were Tejano descendants of the founding families who identify with Texas, loyal to the land. 
not to a foreign government, whether it be in Mexico City, Madrid, or Washington, D.C. Prominent among them was Juan Seguin, member of an old established San Antonio family, a man with close ties to his Anglo neighbors, especially impresario Stephen Austin. At one point, Austin sent his younger brother to the Seguin household in San Antonio to learn Spanish. And at the same time, Seguin sent his son Juan to uh, Austin's colony uh, to learn English. Even when Santa Ana became a dictator, most Texians and Tejanos at first avoided conflict with the central government. But public opinion shifted towards war when Santa Ana allowed his soldiers two days of rape and rampage after brutally crushing an uprising in the Mexican state of Zacatecas. The lesson wasn't lost on the Texans. They might be next. In Zacatecas, one of the states of Mexico, just before the Texian uprising, hundreds, maybe thousands, were put to death as part of a failed revolution. As tensions grew, Santa Ana's soldiers marched to the Texas town of Gonzales, where the locals had been given a cannon for use against Indian raids. The troops were ordered to take it back. It's part of the centralist plan to rein in all the spare arms that are out there. Let's face it, now American colonists pose a much greater threat to the Mexican government than Indians. It was October 2nd, 1835. When the Centralists arrived, the Texians hoisted a flag. The message was clear. When the day was done, the Texians still had the cannon. It's not a battle. It's, it's hardly even a skirmish. But shots are fired, blood is shed, and after October the 2nd, for good or ill, we're committed. We are in revolt. The Texas Revolution had suddenly begun. Encouraged by their early success, the rebels advanced. They went to San Antonio de Bejar, where they would target the Mexican garrison that patrolled its streets. Just outside town, the same garrison maintained the Alamo as a fort. In early December of 1835, 300 Texans battled 1,200 Mexicans. In five days of terrifying house-to-house -house fighting, the sharpshooting Texans killed 200 Mexican troops while losing only four of their own. The Mexicans retreated to the shelter of the Alamo and on December 9th surrendered. There was no vengeance. The Texans disarmed their enemies and sent them back to Mexico, demanding only the promise to fight no further in the war. The rising tensions in Texas and the outbreak of armed conflict was reported in the American press. This widespread coverage would change the nature of the Alamo battle and what it stood for. Newspapers are the CNN of the day. San Antonio was taken by the Texians on the sixth instant by 300... When the Texans began revolting against Mexican rule, there are newspapers all throughout the East that are carrying the story. Newspapers in the South are carrying the story. Volunteers were pouring in from all parts of the United States. A large amount of military... Others are very quick to pick up on that, and when they read this, they're very eager to go participate. Santa Ana will find the Kentucky riflemen bad troops to contend with. In the independence movement actually starts with some of the newer arrivals, people who did not have connections with the Mexican Federation. Independence. Let us write nothing but entire separation from the Mexicans. The idea was, let's have a republic. That republic may exist on its own, or it can always fall back to the United States and become one of the states. Thousands of independence-minded Americans took up arms and marched for Texas. Many of the Texan fighters who took San Antonio de Bejar returned to their homes after the battle thought was given to abandoning the Alamo. As rebel forces organized under a provisional government, Jim Bowie was assigned in January 1836 to inspect the Alamo to consider demolishing the cannon ramps and other fortifications Mexican soldiers had built inside the mission. 
Davy Crockett arrived in February after Bowie had concluded that the Alamo was a strategic outpost that should be manned and defended. William Travis came as well. As a leader in the war movement, he had earned the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in the Texan Army. He and Bowie shared command of the Alamo. As the garrison grew to about 150 men, waiting for the Mexican armies they knew would be coming. But contrary to all expectations, Santa Ana had not waited until spring to launch his counterattack. He had already gathered his soldiers and begun the grueling 600-mile forced march across Mexico's northern deserts in late December 1835. Santa Ana loved to brag that his army suffered greatly that they knew how to suffer. And I, I believe that. I believe that his soldiers knew how to suffer. He made sure they did. As many as 500 troops were lost along the way, but the forced march paid off. Centralist soldiers arrived in San Antonio de Bejar on February 23rd, 1836, weeks before they were expected. The Texas rebels headed into the Alamo for safety the die was cast for the battle to come. The Battle of the Alamo climaxed in a fury of deadly violence in the pre-dawn hours of March 6th, 1836. But that was only part of the story. Manning the Alamo were about 150 defenders, an odd mix that included Europeans and Tejanos. But the majority were Americans, most of them illegal immigrants who had arrived in Texas only weeks before the siege. The Alamo defenders were not, most of them were not colonists, were people that had just arrived to support the war, to get some land, and to get the independence and, and annexation of Texas to the United States. So they were not offending freedom or anything like that. But before there was a battle at the Alamo, there was a siege. It began on February 23rd, 1836, when the Mexicans hung a red flag at the top of San Antonio's San Fernando Church. Visible from the Alamo, it was the flag of no quarter, a well-recognized military signal and a blunt message from the Mexicans. Surrender now, or every last defender will be put to the sword. It was very important to get the Alamo back because it was Mexican territory and they were illegals and, and people that were defying Mexican government. Even for the Mexicans as well, they were fighting in defense of their country against an armed invasion. And here at, at the Alamo, they had an opportunity to break the will of this insurrection. And at this point, that's what it was, an insurrection. The men of the Alamo responded with a defiant statement of their own. Firing a single cannon shot, the bravado of the Texans was made perfectly clear. They intended to stay and fight. The old mission was never built for military use, but its protection seemed adequate, at least at the start of the siege. About 17 cannons were scattered at various positions. Riflemen did not have the loopholes and other firing ports found in a proper fortress, but the Texans could safely lay low in the thick walls as they aimed rifles at Mexican troops, still hundreds of yards distant. As the siege began, the Texans effectively lost one of their most charismatic leaders. Jim Bowie was suddenly bedridden by illness, thought to be advanced tuberculosis. The most fearless Texian of them all would no longer be a factor at the Alamo. Command of the men fell to William Barrett Travis alone. The young lawyer from Alabama who so advocated war for Texas independence now confronted the fight of his life. He's still only 26. A man at that age today in the United States in some places would have to show ID just to buy cigarettes. Yet he's in command of the Alamo at that age. He's come a long, long way. 
Outside the walls, General Santa Anna put his cannons to work, knowing the Alamo could not be taken immediately, and the time was on his side. Santa Anna and his officers carry out a European-style siege that takes nearly two weeks to complete, with the final battle being what people remember as the Battle of the Alamo. On the first day of the siege, Mexican troops were lined up on the banks of the San Antonio River, across from the Alamo. Santa Ana's cannons slowly battered away at the walls of the fort. It was military state-of-the-art for 1836, from a man who called himself the Napoleon of the West. On February 23rd, as the siege began, Travis wrote the first of several letters that couriers sneaking out of the Alamo would carry. He addressed it to his fellow citizens and compatriots and pledged victory or death. But he also made an urgent plea for reinforcements. They knew that they could not hold that fort indefinitely. The men of the Alamo did not want to die gloriously. They wanted to live profitably. So the deal was, we will hold this place till the rest of, of Texas can join us. And you can tell from every letter that Travis writes from the Alamo, every letter is a plea. OK, guys, they're here now. Uh, we really could use your help. Now would be a good time. Travis wrote his letters to Texas provisional government. He waited for relief but he never received a reply. The governmental council was 100 miles away. So was the Texian military leader, General Sam Houston. There was wide disagreement on how to defend against the Mexicans, and so nothing was done at all. Why didn't the Texians go to the uh, assistance of the Alamo? Well, the sad fact is, and this is a part of the Alamo story that's rarely told, the Texian government that would have organized those relief efforts had fallen apart in dissension and discord. February 25th, day three. Santa Ana launched an infantry attack against the Alamo South Wall. The Texans, well protected in the fort, easily repulsed the raid, inflicting a number of casualties. And already, Crockett proved his value, his magnetic personality inspiring the defenders to fight ferociously. As Travis wrote, the Honorable David Crockett was seen at all points, animating the men to do their duty. However, in the cold calculus of war, the day belonged to the Mexicans. The attack on the 25th is an advance on the part of Santa Ana. He is on the Texian side of the river, and he controls the Gonzales Road. Despite Mexican control of the roads, the Tejano patriot Juan Seguin slipped out that night with another dispatch from Travis, again urging other Texas communities to send reinforcements. Seguin's mission kept him away from the Alamo when the final battle took place. However, as the days passed, Alamo couriers faced increasing danger. From his newly won spot on the Texan side of the river, Santa Ana expanded his siege around the Alamo. What he's going to do is encircle the Alamo. At least he tries to do that. Now, whether he's consciously letting courier traffic in and out in order to bring as many people as he can into the trap, we don't know. As he strengthened his chokehold on the Alamo, Santa Ana continued his bombardment of its walls. The arcane Napoleonic art of reducing walls into piles of rubble is difficult to imagine in the 21st century, unless you design and build a full-scale fortress wall. This run of stonework approximates the height and thickness of the Alamo walls. It was built in Texas by a modern-day contractor. 30 of these six-pound cannonballs, close to the size used by Santa Ana at the Alamo, will be fired at the test wall. The cannon is placed a little over 200 yards away, just outside the range of Texan riflemen at the Alamo. Then the test of cannon versus wall gets underway. 
The first shot hits the lower right corner, lodging more than a foot and a half inside the wall. Compared to modern explosive shells, a cannonball does little damage. That's why a siege, like that at the Alamo, took so long. When the uh, projectile hits the wall, you might get some broken rocks and things like that. The whole idea is over weeks, perhaps months, to break a hole in the wall. The problem is, is the defenders at night, when you can't see them, are filling the wall in again. If the defenders work through the night fixing damaged walls, they would need to sleep during the day when the cannon fire started all over again. For the sleepless Texans, it was a vicious cycle. On March 1st, day eight of the siege, reinforcements arrived. Under cover of darkness, 32 men sneaked into the Alamo. They came from nearby Gonzales. The town where the war had started with a defiant banner and a cannon shot. The new troops, however few, gave the beleaguered Travis a glimmer of hope. I think Travis's goal uh, is to gather as many Texians as he can into the Alamo and at, at least, at the very least, delay the army, if not defeat the army. Altogether, as many as 100 men made it into the Alamo during the siege bringing the garrison's strength to 250. In light of the scant reinforcements, on March 3rd, the 10th day of the siege, Travis wrote another of his letters to the outside world. But now, his defiant tone gave way to bitterness. He says, look, I'm gonna stay here, and my men are gonna stay here, and we may well die here. And he said, our bones will reproach our countrymen for their neglect. On day 12 of the siege, March 5th, Santa Ana decided to bring it to an end. He announced a time for the final assault on the Alamo, the next morning at 5 a.m. He met with his officers to lay out the plan. Soldiers were ordered to scale the Alamo walls at any cost. No prisoners were to be taken. All the Alamo defenders must die. And Santa Ana would take his breakfast inside the captured fort. On the afternoon before the final battle, Santa Ana called a halt to the artillery bombardment. For the first time in nearly two weeks, the ragged Alamo defenders could finally rest. But even as the Texans drifted off to sleep, Mexican soldiers quietly took their battle positions. In a few hours, both sides would rise to the call of war and fight the epic Alamo battle, making history as well as legend. The long two-week siege of the Alamo failed to inflict any casualties on the Texans. As many as 250 defenders remained inside when the final battle began quietly at 5 a.m. on March 6, 1836. In the darkness, 1,800 Mexican soldiers waited in their attack positions, just 100 yards from the Alamo walls. The Mexican artillery was silent, and inside the Alamo, Weary Texans were having their first undisturbed sleep in nearly two weeks. Santa Ana prepared to give the command that would unleash the attack. However, in one of the few failures of Santa Ana's battle plan, an anxious soldier began to shout before the order was given. Viva Santa Ana! Viva la República! The shout spread, bugles sounded, and the troops advanced. The noise caused the Mexicans to lose some of the surprise they hoped for. Within the Alamo, Texans awakened to the clamor of war. Travis rallied his men to the walls, and the fierce fighting began. Santa Ana's battle plan called for the advancing columns to hit the Alamo on three sides. The smallest, 125 men, attacked the south wall. More than 400 soldiers charged in from the east. Nearly 800 attacked the north wall in the northwest corner. Inside the walls, Jim Bowie remained on his sickbed. 
he was too ill to take part in the fighting at all. Davy Crockett led a group of defenders at the Alamo's south wall, successfully fending off the Mexican attack there. William Travis rushed to the north wall with his slave Joe fighting alongside him. A moment later, Travis was dead. He had been a leader in the movement to fight for Texas independence. Now, his war was over. It's Joe who sees his master go down with a bullet to the head. But after that, Joe later says that he simply goes and hides and takes no further part in the actual battle itself, since he doesn't really have a stake in it. Regardless of who wins, he's still a slave. Joe simply looks out for himself. Though Travis was killed early in the battle, the Alamo defenders fought on without their commander. Skilled Texan riflemen mounted the walls, pouring fire on the Mexicans as fast as they could. Cannons loaded with rusty chains, nails, and other scraps pounded the invading columns with deadly effect. And for a time, the attack stalled. But Santa Ana had 400 fresh soldiers in reserve, and he sent them against the North Wall. Now the sheer force of numbers overwhelmed the Texans as Mexican troops neared the top. No military plan survives contact with the enemy. Santa Ana is no different. But his plan must have been somewhat solid, as well as his preparation, because it only takes a half hour once the attack is commenced for the Mexicans to breach the Alamo's defenses. Those defenses were nothing more than the Alamo's thick walls, which now proved fatal to the Texan riflemen. With the Mexicans on the ground below, the Texans had to stand up to fire their rifles, making them easy targets for enemy muskets. Another problem for the Texans was the sheer size of the Alamo. Its perimeter walls stretched a quarter of a mile. If the defenders were stationed evenly around the compound, there would be only one every seven feet, a mere 33 on the north wall. But the Mexicans had more than a numerical advantage. The American version of the Alamo story often overlooks the professionalism of Santa Ana's army, perhaps the battle's most important factor. Texians brought a knife to a gunfight, and the Mexican army has uh, been very active for about the past 18 months. They know what they're doing. It's a tough army to beat. Soon after the North Wall defenses collapsed, the West Wall was breached, and Mexican soldiers poured into the Alamo from two sides. The surviving Texans fell back to their second line of defense the long barracks on the east side of the Alamo. Outside, in the courtyard, Mexican soldiers discovered the Alamo defenders had neglected to disable the fort's artillery. It was a costly error. The invading troops turned the Texans' own cannons back toward the long barracks. What should have been a refuge became a death trap. A few Texans inside the barracks waved white flags of surrender, but other Texans had no intention of surrendering and continued to fire. Taking fire under a white flag, the Mexicans were enraged and rushed inside to finish the job with pistols and bayonets, killing everyone, taking no prisoners. Eventually, they came upon Jim Bowie. One Mexican account we have that deals with his death says that he was found hiding under a blanket. The Mexicans thought he was hiding. In fact, he was probably too sick to get up from his blanket. And so his death was not so much a death in battle as a simple execution. Jim Bowie died from several gunshots to the head. He was a man whose bravery and personal magnetism helped rally support to the Texas war movement. But his death was far from glorious. Davy Crockett was said to be among the last to fall. Though whether he died fighting or was executed, is a matter still open to question. There was killing outside the Alamo as well. Some 40 to 60 Texans made a dash for safety, but were cut down by Santa Ana's waiting cavalry. By 6.30 a.m., only an hour and a half after Santa Ana's final attack had begun, the battle was over. Dawn revealed a surreal landscape of broken bodies and smoking ruins. The Tejanos, 
the Europeans, the American volunteers, the Gonzales 32 were dead. Like most wars, the Alamo battle was drenched in the blood of its soldiers and uplifted by their sacrifice. But it's not known exactly how many died on either side. Few conflicts, in fact, come to us so draped in mystery, twisted by distortions and riddled with questions. How did Davy Crockett really die? Was Santa Ana's victory more costly than defeat? And is the true story of the Alamo still waiting to be found? The distortion of Alamo history began even before the smoke had lifted from the battlefield. With the fighting ended, Santa Ana dictated a letter to his Secretary of War in which he boasted of killing 600 Alamo defenders. Santana inflates the number of Alamo slain to a ridiculously high level. In fact, his private secretary, Ramon Caro, later says, well, I knew this was ridiculous when I wrote it, but what are you going to do? He's the president of Mexico. He gives me the number. He says, write it. So we know that Santana's numbers are, are, are not right. Other, more objective Mexican sources put the number at around 250, a figure most historians accept as accurate. Many of the names of the Texan dead are inscribed on a monument in San Antonio, known as the Alamo Cenotaph. Only 189 have been identified. The others are the unknown soldiers of the battle. And we desperately would like to know the names. We probably will never know the names of, of all the men who, who uh, died inside the Alamo. The Mexican losses have also been distorted in some accounts of the story. The numbers of Mexican casualties have been inflated to ridiculous levels and some pretty authoritative sources. Some people cite them as high as, uh, you know, 1,500 casualties. That's ridiculous. Part of the reason we have so many different figures is the winner gets to write the history and ultimately the Texians win the Texas Revolution. So uncertain is the information that even professional historians do not agree on the Mexican dead. Known casualties number between 521 and 550. Santa Ana lost approximately half of the assault force. At the end of the day, on March 6th, there are 60 soldados that were killed. Now you can double that figure probably and come up with the number of wounded and then a percentage of those would have been mortally wounded. So the Texians, contrary to uh, what a lot of Texans would like to believe, did not wreak that much damage on their enemy. Another element of the Alamo story that elevates it to mythic status is the popular misconception that everyone in the Alamo was killed. A few women and children who lived in some Alamo buildings were inside the walls and hid during the battle. They were not part of the defending garrison and were spared by the Mexicans, but a number of other people lived as well. Another survivor was Travis's slave, Joe, who was returned to Travis's family in the United States. But on the one year anniversary of the battle, he escaped. A reward for his return was offered by the executor of Travis's estate, but Joe stayed hidden for the next 40 years. That's a long period of a man's life simply to disappear. But then he was just Joe. We don't even know what last name he had, if he had one, or what last name he would have chosen to use, which makes it very possible for him simply to fall through the cracks of all the records. Joe resurfaced briefly in Austin, Texas, when a local newspaper mentioned him in an 1877 article about the Texas War. Nothing more was said, however, and he disappeared once again. Soon after the Alamo fell, rumors circulated of defenders who may have survived. 20 days after the battle, the Arkansas Gazette reported about two who lived. Perhaps they had managed to elude Santa Ana's cavalry outside the Alamo. However, neither their names nor the specifics of their stories were included, and so the two have vanished into history.
The Alamo survivor who is known by name is Brigido Guerrero, one of the Tejanos who fought in the battle. His name is assigned to a tract of land, one of many Texas granted to veterans of its war for independence. But Guerrero is the only such veteran to receive his grant for surviving the Alamo. Guerrero's original claim is well over a century old and must be handled with care. It is preserved in the archives of Bear County, where the Alamo is located. Your petitioner, Brigido Guerrero of the County of Bear, State of Texas, respectfully represents that he was one of those who entered the Alamo under Colonel Travis in February of 1836, that he was one of the defenders of that place, that he remained there up to the last moment, and that when after the storming of the place by the Mexican army, he saw that there was no hope left, he had the good fortune of saving his life by concealing himself. At the Texas General Land Office in Austin, researchers have uncovered records identifying another possible survivor. His name is Henry Warnell. A 500-acre plot of land, the long-shaded rectangle on this computerized map was originally granted to Henry Warnell's son based on Henry's Alamo service. All but one of the documents in Warnell's file say he was killed at the Alamo. The one letter that says Warnell survived claims he died soon after the battle, 140 miles away at Port Lavaca on the Gulf Coast. However, Port Lavaca didn't yet exist when the Alamo fell. The author of the letter, one Henry Anderson, appears nowhere else in early Texas history. Who he was and why he wrote the letter, nobody knows. Could Henry Warnell have been one of the two survivors reported in the Arkansas newspaper? Like so much else about the Alamo, the Warnell case remains a mystery. Perhaps no aspect of the Alamo story has been mythologized more than the deaths of its three most celebrated heroes, William Travis, Jim Bowie, and Davy Crockett. Though Travis was among the first to die, some newspapers reported that he had actually stabbed himself rather than be captured. Historians generally agree that Jim Bowie was sick with tuberculosis and helpless during the March 6th assault. Nevertheless, popular legend has Bowie fighting back, a story that originated in a newspaper interview with his mother. You have the mother of James Bowie, who replies that knowing her son James, he probably sat up in bed and killed at least 20 or 30 Mexicans with his Bowie knife. She said it, his mother in Louisiana. Perhaps not surprisingly, it is Davy Crockett's death that has soared to the greatest mythic heights. From the very first news accounts in 1836, through later paintings, books, and movies, Davy Crockett embodied the Alamo spirit of defiance and sacrifice. If you talk about popular belief in the late 20th century, then it's certainly that set by the Disney version of 1955. You know, Davy Crockett swinging his rifle, one of the last to go down fighting at the Alamo. Increasingly, however, historians are beginning to suspect that Crockett was actually captured alive at the Alamo and then executed. The story was told just that way by a Texan sergeant named Frank Dolson. As far as I'm concerned, the best evidence we have uh, as to how Davy Crockett died comes from something that's usually referred to as the Dolson letter. Dolson was asked to serve as interpreter during the debriefing of a Mexican officer. According to Dolson, the Mexican officer witnessed the execution of prisoners following the Battle of the Alamo, uh, and one of these prisoners was Davy Crockett. In the debriefing, the unnamed officer said that immediately after the Alamo battle, a Mexican general named Castrillan had taken six American prisoners. As the prisoners were brought forward, the informant happened to be standing next to another officer, Colonel Juan Almonte. Juan Almonte was 
we know from letters he was writing from New Orleans in 1834 that he was uh, aware of who Davy Crockett was. And according to Dolson's informant, uh, Almonte says, the man behind there among the prisoners, that's the famous David Crockett. The informant said that Santa Ana had angrily refused Castrillon's request to spare the prisoners' lives. They were executed on the spot. Dolson included the remarkable story in a letter to his brother, which was eventually published in a Detroit newspaper. A similar account of the execution that also mentions Crockett by name appeared in the diary of a Mexican officer named Jose Enrique de la Pena. According to de la Pena, other soldiers stepped forth from the ranks of Santa Ana's retinue and killed these men with sword thrusts uh, not immediate death, but a slow, difficult death with repeated sword thrusts. Uh, and the men died, according to De La Pena, moaning, but without humiliating themselves before their captors. The execution scenario seems hard for many people to accept. For them, Davy Crockett's death while fighting is far more heroic than a brutal execution. But do these apparent facts really diminish Crockett and the others who were put to the sword? Think about it. What happened during World War II? Korea, Vietnam, or a desert storm, or Iraq. When you have somebody who was overwhelmed, taken, and then they're executed, does that make them any less of a hero? Of course not. The dead Alamo defenders became folk heroes almost instantly, at least in the American version of the story. As the war for Texas independence continued, the death of the Alamo martyrs provided the passion that would lead the Texans to victory. Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana was the victor of the Battle of the Alamo, a military hero to the nation of Mexico. He had risen to the pinnacle of power, but in lacking mercy for the vanquished, he suffered a fatal flaw. He gave no quarter at the battle and burned rather than buried the bodies of the Alamo's dead. Santa Ana hoped to crush the spirit of rebellious Texans in other parts of the state. The effect was just the opposite. By insisting on killing every single combatant, he made it a last stand that inspired rather than depressed. Who's responsible for the moral power of the Alamo? Antonio Lopez de Santana. That moral power is embodied in the often repeated battle cry, remember the Alamo. With it came the indignation that fueled the rebellion. The Texas War of Independence was now in full force. During the Alamo siege, Delegates meeting a hundred miles away at a town called Washington on the Brazos had signed a Texas Declaration of Independence and formed a government. The Texas Army was officially placed under command of General Sam Houston. Houston was once the governor of Tennessee, a protege of Andrew Jackson, and an activist in Texas politics from the time he first arrived in 1832. As Santa Ana's troops fanned out after the Battle of the Alamo, General Jose Urea approached from the south. Near the town of Goliad, 75 miles from San Antonio de Bejar, Urea's army captured nearly 350 Texan troops. Prisoners were held inside their own headquarters, the old Spanish fort called Presidio La Bahia, which was established as a Texan outpost in 1749. The rebels nursed their wounds and remained in captivity for a week. Under Mexican law, they were considered pirates. And though Urea had standing orders to execute them all, he appealed to Santa Ana to spare the men. Santa Ana would not budge. Mexican soldiers marched the Texans out of their fort and opened fire on the unarmed men. Even the wounded were shot, and nearly all the prisoners were killed including their commander, James W. Fannin. To the Texans, the war became a blood feud. 
Remember Goliad now joined Remember the Alamo as a battle cry. For Santa Ana, it was just another step toward the heart of the Texas Revolution. Santa Ana's goal is, yes, to take down the Alamo, to take down Goliad and destroy those fortifications, but his objective is the center of gravity is the Texian government in, in the interior of the colonies. Santa Ana learned that the Texas government was on the run, that Sam Houston's army of 900 men was encamped on the San Jacinto River. There, the final battle of the Texas Revolution would take place. Among Houston's men was the Tejano Juan Seguin of San Antonio de Bejar, the man who carried messages out of the Alamo before it fell. Seguin had raised his own unit of Tejanos to fight against Mexico. Houston was afraid his Texians might mistake the Tejanos for Mexican enemies. So Seguin's men identified themselves with tags in their hats, eager to proclaim, Recuerden el Alamo, remember the Alamo. On April 21st, 1836, 1,200 Mexican troops were at rest in their tents when Houston's army attacked. Santa Ana was confident, and his sentries failed to spot the approaching Texans. Santa Ana certainly has very little respect for the Texans, whom he considers pirates, and those who hold their enemy in contempt are liable to get in trouble. The classic case is the Battle of San Jacinto. The Texans charged, so surprising the enemy that the battle was a rout. 600 Mexicans were killed. By the time the Texan fighters got to San Jacinto, they were determined to win, not to be taken captive, and you have to say, to take their share of vengeance as well. It was the only battle Santa Ana's army lost after the Alamo, but it was the only battle that mattered. And Santa Ana handles the campaign up to a point very well but he ultimately loses in a disaster. Based on the, the end result at San Jacinto, he's certainly no Napoleon. He's something of the West, but it isn't Napoleon. Santa Ana was captured the next day. Some Texans wanted to lynch him. A wounded Sam Houston held them back. In exchange for his life and his freedom, Santa Ana signed what is known as the Treaty of Velasco, requiring him to recognize Texan independence. In the Texas Revolution, the battle that gets the most attention, of course, is going to be the Alamo. But if it had not been for the battle at San Jacinto, where the Centralist forces, where Santa Ana's forces were defeated, we wouldn't remember the Alamo, because the war would have been a successful Mexican campaign to put down a rebellious state, and Texas would have remained part of Mexico. Santa Ana later led his country's troops against Americans in the Mexican War of 1848, losing even more lands in Texas, plus huge territories now comprising most of the western United States. He remained active in politics for 20 years after the Alamo. But ultimately, Mexico tired of Santa Ana. He spent his last days in a squalid residence before dying penniless at 84 in the year 1876. He was a uh, living embarrassment and at the same time the scapegoat for everything that had gone wrong in Mexican history. But history on the other side of the border began to change as Texas became part of the United States and the American version of the Alamo story took on a life of its own.